So hi, my name is Eric Beaumont. I'm the global product manager for Ventus. Uh, yeah, if your phone rings, I'll call you out on it. It's OK. Um, so I'm here to talk about a little bit of a strange topic uh, because it's really broad. And what it is is it's showrooms, presentations, interactive displays, all of these sorts of things. Our company has been around for about 10 years making a software to do exactly these things. And what I'll just do is uh, start off with a showreel, just to give you a couple examples of the kinds of things that we do. Um, it's an authoring tool for real-time rendering, but it's used for all sorts of things. Example would be large video walls, touch-enabled, interactive, however that might be. Microsoft uses us, for example, CBIT. All of their presentations are done in our software. Um, an example for Microsoft is they do 18 presentations, each 20 minutes long, fully interactive, 3D, 2D combined. And the really difficult thing with Microsoft is that they're changing their mind, even what their products are called, until about five minutes before the presentation, which is really great if you've put a lot of time into the design effort, and then all of a sudden somebody says, well, but actually Metro, you know what, uh, that's about to go into feedback, so you want to turn that down just a little bit. Thank you. So um, anyway, the Microsoft stuff that allows them to change Aaron, feedback. Thank you. Good, much better. Um, so basically, this is also another one of our customers, VW. You'll see Lang. There's all sorts of examples of interactive walls um, and content. Yeah, that's, you want to be careful with that. It's humming right on the edge. Sorry, I'm just nervous because when it starts squeaking, everybody's going to run screaming. The important thing about Ventus is we are three things. Number one, we are a real-time tool, a real-time render. What does that mean? That means you can make anything interactive. If you have a linear process or pre-rendered content, video, what it is, you're stuck sort of in a directional timeline. And you can jump around inside the timeline, but you're not truly interactive. So being a nonlinear tool or a real-time tool means you're completely interactive. Number two, we are a 3D tool. We are completely 3D, the entire thing. Doesn't mean you can't do 2D content, because 2D is exactly the same as 3D without a depth to it. But you can do also sort of really cool things in 3D space with it if you want to. Second thing is we are phenomenally scalable. We do clustering, we do all sorts of uh, frame-locked uh, multiplication of screens, all of that sort of thing. Just to give you an example, um, this is a 4K screen. So we came in and played and said, can you do 4K? Yes, we can do 4K. We have one example for Fujitsu Siemens running on 72K by 1K in real time, fully interactive. And that was back in 2006, back when, sorry. So we can cluster machines ad nauseum as much as we need. The other thing about it is this interactivity thing is not just touch. That's one of the common sort of mistakes people do. People think about interactivity and they limit it to, OK, I'm going to touch a wall or you know, your iPad interactivity. No, interactivity is much, much larger than that. It can mean you have some sort of sensor data. Somebody walks up to a screen and it does something. That's interactivity. You could have RFID chips. Somebody walks into a trade show booth, triggers something. That's interactivity. And the tool is really built towards that concept of interactivity, changing things on the fly as is needed. So you've seen, I mean, all sorts of brand names, all sorts of people. But the one thing that I'd like to point out is how different all of these things are. There's all sorts of different ideas. And really, the concept with Ventus was, let's take a tool that allows you creative freedom to go out, get a really cool idea, and how are you going to realize it? And that's what it's built for. So, what I'm going to do is uh, go through here. Whoops, go a little bit closer. And I'm going to um, focus on the actual topic, which was important, or which I wanted to bring to you, is that what we found is that Hollywood and all of the Hollywood movies and TV and all of that sort of thing, computer games, are dictating to all of you what is the future going to look like. Okay? So you see Iron Man, Tony Stark's computer. You see Minority Report. I will not count the number of times a customer comes to us and says, I'd like Minority Report. And you say, that's a really good idea. The problem with it is that this sort of movement, after about five minutes, you're really tired. And if you were a bank clerk, you'd have biceps like this. Um, but anyway, that's what they see. That's the future. That's what they want. Okay? They see Avatar. Avatar is these great computers. At the same time, they think internally, OK, none of this stuff is realistic. It's all science fiction. None of this can be done. What I'd like to show you in the course, I'm going to show you about four projects that we've done in the past couple of years with our software. All of these things are actually doable. Some of it's smoke and mirrors, giant magnets under the ground, whatever you want. But they're all doable. Okay? So let's uh, start. Audi City, um, big showroom in London. Started in London, the first one. They're building them all over the world. Um, this was actually in cooperation with RTT. 
and ICT. Um, RTT does a very, very high-end real-time renderer. Um, the idea behind this showroom was let's create a virtual showroom with real things, virtual things, all blended together, and it's the way that you should go buy a car if you were in the future. Okay? So everything is interactive. You go, you play with them, you see them on giant screens, screens everywhere. Every element can be touched, can be worked with. And why didn't they just go with just a real-time renderer like RTT? It's because we're specialized in the real-time interactivity. Okay? And that's what we do very, very well. A real-time renderer like RTT is used for the configurator. So you can go in, see exactly what the color of the stitching is going to be like. Right? That's, it's important when you're going to be looking at the car, seeing what you're going to buy. You want to see that the colors are precise. But when you're going into interactivity, you want to use a touch screen. You want to touch interfaces. You want things to happen. There can be no delay. Any of you that played computer games or something like that, you know what playing a computer game at 10 frames per second is like. Yeah. You're not going to be able to act quickly enough. So that's one of the things that we're able to bring to it. And with the combination of both, they used us for a lot of the interface things, for splitting the screens across massive video walls, all that sort of thing. And then for the configurators and for the parts where the detail and the, really all of the attention to the colors and everything was necessary, then RTT could come in and do the really precise rendering. And the combination of both allowed them to build this amazing showroom. Now, the first idea is, is this going to work? Is this going to be really cool? The numbers that have come out of that showroom are stunning. I don't have the exact percentages, but uh, recently Audi was giving some presentations, and some of the percentages were just unbelievable. The average time a person spends in this showroom is 50 minutes. Take that to any other showroom, right? The average customer coming in and spending 50 minutes with your products, playing with them, looking at them. The number of percentage of people buying the product after having played with it without having ever test drive. It, something like 40%, something that's huge. It's enormous. It's a stunningly successful story. So let's uh, see you next. This is another good example of interactivity. So this company, um, Manfilter, I probably shouldn't say this on microphone because I'm being recorded, but they have possibly the world's most boring product. They do industrial filters. Okay? This is a phenomenally difficult problem if you're trying to do a trade show, show booth and you want people to come and look at your industrial filters. So what did they do? They built an amazingly designed booth with an amazingly designed touch table. Okay, now touch tables are one of those things everybody assumes, okay, you gotta have a team of programmers, et cetera, et cetera. We don't. So the company that did this, Stereolize, they actually built this curved touch table, which is beautifully designed, and then gave every uh, salesperson a steel marker. And that steel marker contained an RFID chip and a fiducial marker with their information in it. So plunks it on the table, it builds up their menu right in front of them with this sort of space age, high tech, well designed kind of an interface. You can see here the table, it's nice and curved, it's a nice big table. So I think uh, 20 or so people had place it, but as many could touch it as uh, wanted. This is actually the interface, yeah? And that's what they were actually touching. And that's well designed, it's cool, it looks like the future should look. So this company selling industrial filters had throngs of people coming up to their table to play with their, you know, Normally, the way to achieve that is with other methods, but you know, bribery didn't work at this time. So that's what it actually looks like. You put the steel marker on, whoops, uh, and of course, I actually just triggered my LiDAR there by accident. Went too close to the screen. Never mind. This is the next thing, and this is one of those uh, projects that people tell us is impossible, holographic proje projection. Yeah, you see Tony Stark's computer, you see uh, Avatar, everything is holographic thing, people looking out of it. Everybody tells you that's not possible. Well, here it is. This is actually a presenter. Standing in front of his uh, presentation, it's all in front of him in 3D. There's actually a version of stereoscopic 3D. And um, this is actually for LG in Spain. So how did they do that? Again, smoke and mirrors. It was a nice thin foil, tiny little thing. It was actually invisible to the eye um, at, in that lightning level. And they projected onto it. The effect was that in front of you and me, for example, there would be this very thin foil, and all of my content would be in front of me, in front of you, and we would be talking to each other with the content for me, rather than me talking behind. Yeah. Phenomenally cool idea. Very easily doable. The only caveat is, of course, you have to be in charge of the lighting of the room, because it's not going to work with very, very bright lights. Nonetheless, this is one of those things that if a customer came to you and said, OK, I want a showroom with holographic projection, you'd probably be forced to say no but it's actually very easily doable. So, come on, behave, thank you. 
Audi's done several things. This is a very cool idea because what Audi came in and they said, we'd like some augmented reality with uh, a very cool showroom and it's for the A8 launches and all that sort of thing. And the company Three Monkeys, who's a phenomenal design house, went away and came back with this idea, which is an inverse augmented reality. And it's just a stunningly simple but cool idea. So the idea was to show the inside of the car and what all the new features were, but the outside hadn't changed that much. So what they did is they built a screen on a motorized chassis that moves in front of the car and highlights all of the new features in the car. If you think about the concept, it's really easy. But what is this? It's something falling over. You've, so that's going to be on sound later, right? OK. Um, where was I? Right, car. This is actually a scene. The idea that they were inspired by was Hollywood. Total Recall. Arnold Schwarzenegger going in front of the x-ray screen, you know, getting x ready to run by. That was the idea that they started with. And then they went to reality. All of these things are Hollywood driving, how are we going to do these cool futuristic things that we've come to expect? Right? Then, of course, they had this very high-end showroom with uh, nice plushy leather seats and control things and all of that sort of thing. So now this is going to take a little sec to do. So what does Ventus actually do? Like I said, it's a real-time 3D engine. This is Ventus. So this whole presentation I've been doing with all the video, of course, driving by a LiDAR. But if I go in here, there we go. So this is done by a company called Blaufisch in uh, Germany. They're a really, really cool company. Thanks to them for letting me use this. Um, this was actually just sort of a, hey, let's build something cool kind of a moment. It wasn't actually for a specific project or anything like that. But one of the things that it illustrated was how easy it was to do a really cool project with Ventus. They didn't need to actually, let me grab that, there we go, do anything complex with it. Now, I would challenge you to do something like this in any other software or tool. It takes a lot of work. You need programmers, you need people to design 3D. All they did is they took a fairly high level CAD model, converted it to a little bit lower polygon, imported it in here, attached a multi-touch thing, and it was done. Obviously, it took a little bit more know-how because they did some reflections too, which are cool. But nonetheless, that's the principle. And what we've tried to do is exactly a tool to address this kind of a thing. We want to do some cool content. We want to do really interesting displays, giant video walls, whatever we want. But we want a tool that's flexible enough to allow us to do that. Now, the interesting thing is all of you have seen Ventus in action all the time. You probably don't know it. So things, for example, who wants to be a millionaire, the TV show. That's Ventus. Yeah, all of the answer processing, all of that sort of thing, doing the on-air graphics in studio, that's Ventus. If you've watched sports on television, a lot of the sports graphics are actually Ventus in action. Um, we've had all sorts of various game shows and things like that. We're there all the time. The thing is, most of you will never have known it as a product such as that. But we're all over the place. We're very well used. And um, basically, what I like to do is to have you ask some questions. Um, I'm going to be here. We have another 15 minutes. What I would like to do is show you a couple examples of um, various Ventus things. But if you have questions, I would invite you to ask them, and I will address them as I go through some of these other scenes. OK? So can I walk with this microphone on without it? OK. So yeah. OK, absolutely. So as I'm going to be doing, just feel free to throw in and ask some questions, and I'll be more than happy to address them directly. So. Yes? Um, I'm interested. I'm impressed by what okay. you demonstrated. Yes. Oh, no doubt. Can you give any idea about the project time needs uh, for the last example you gave? That one? Yeah. yeah. I That's have no project. idea, but uh, only a f they, they're not a big company. They have a couple guys. So it's a few guys in a couple of days. Not okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, very, very quickly. Okay. Yes, I will. So he's asking what the project time was to yeah. create this last project. So the next thing that I want to sort of talk about a little bit and feel free, like I say, to come in with questions. This is a little bit of a different project. This was uh, something done with a company called CubeServe, which are one of the top integrators for SAP. Um, one of the things that SAP has been working on or talking about is the gamification of the data visualization market. And this is something we've been working on a long time, is there's a difference between data visualization and data presentation. Okay? Data visualization is lots of scientific data. And you present it, and it's, it's all very great for specialists and scientists and all that sort of thing. This is something very, very different. This is taking the data, and this is what you would do in a showroom or a presentation all the time. It's taking the data and telling a story with it. 
you can't have giant masses of data coming through that you then have to try and explain. Um, Jed, yes. could you take the mouse? I'm not going to be able to reach up there with my LiDAR. Um, could you take the mouse and go up to the real-time demo thing and just turn that off? Yes. Just drag it. There, thank you. Good. So yeah. what this is is actually an entire SAP database being read out for the electricity grid. And I can't remember which city it was. But it's an entire electrical city, uh, electrical grid of a city being read out. Where is the electricity coming from? How much is being generated? What sources is it coming from? And we're visualizing or presenting it in a fashion that's much more closer to a computer game or something that's easily digestible. Okay, one of the biggest things that we found is that a lot of people are taking masses of data and presenting their data visualization to the audience. And the audience sits there going, wow, that's really pretty. I have no idea what you're talking about. Right? And that's a very common problem. Ventus is a tool with which you can present select parts of data and tell a story with it. And it's a design tool, so it allows you to design it very, very carefully and elaborately and good looking without going into um, all of the detail that's unnecessary. Now, another interesting thing about data presentation is that Ventus is a real-time tool. So all of the data coming in here is coming in in real time. As the data changes, so will the presentation. Yeah? This is uh, an SAP database. It's actually was connected to a HANA database. HANA is the new SAP system that's loaded up entirely in memory, so they can fire off queries in real time extremely fast. That's not a whole lot of use if you don't have a presentation system in front that's then processing that data in real time. So let me just see if I can get this without triggering a, yes, I can. This is for DHL. Same principle. This is a DHL database tracking all of their shipping for a certain area. And what it's actually doing is it's saying, OK, so how can we visualize this in a way that I could tell a story with it? I could make it interesting, make it compelling, and not be beating people to death with Excel spreadsheets and, and all of that sort of thing, right? So this is an example. Now, um, this scene is, was actually built for a touch screen, um, not for a LiDAR. So half the buttons are at the top. OK. Nope. Eh. Oh, can you go with the mouse there, Jed? Thank you. <laughs> All right. So for example, here's actually several of the current um, shipments underway. Uh, they can see exactly the time where they're going, uh, when they'll be delivered. And I have all of the actual information regarding the transaction times and the shipment times here in graphs. And all of these graphs are real time. These are not canned data. It's stuff that's being updated as the database is updated. Yeah. So we're trying to take this whole idea of presentation to a different level. Now, another example uh, is Porsche. Porsche has been using Ventus to do all of their launch events for years, ever since the first Cayenne launch. And the idea, the big problem that they faced, and this was for the Cayenne, was uh, you've all seen the Cayenne? OK, then you understand the inherent problem of launching the Cayenne as a design team, right? It doesn't look like a Porsche. So they knew if they just unveiled the car, everybody would sit there and moan and complain that it wasn't a Porsche. So instead, what they did is they built this amazing presentation where they explained every single design line of the car without ever showing the car. And then at the end, they bring it together into one car, and it's all amazing, and everybody's blown away. And then the technical team that came afterwards with the PowerPoint felt entirely depressed. And then they moved on to Ventus for all of their other presentations after that. But that's the idea behind it. Yeah, you're telling a story, so you need a presentation tool that allows you to do that sort of thing. All right. Any other questions so far? Well, just to bring more. Yes. To me, this is the impression of what we would like to call an interactive infographic. Yes. You know, in Interact, yes. Yeah. Interactive yeah. infographic, yeah. right. Yeah. So, wow. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So the next thing that I wanted to talk about is scalability. So all of this is running on a 4K screen, 4K projector, 4K native. If I wanted to run this on an 8K projector, if one existed, which it doesn't, but we could pretend it was, I would put another 8K projector in, put the same project in, and run it at 8K, because we're generating everything in real time. All right? One of the interesting things that we're facing is that with the display technology increasing so rapidly, pixel densities are getting tighter and tighter. Yeah? Screen sizes are getting larger and larger. Who's going to make the content? So we recently had a request for a video wall, and it was hundreds of screens. 
And I asked some people, well, so OK, so what resolution are you going to be? Oh, well, HD. OK, great. So that's HD across 100. That's going to look really bad. No HD per screen. OK, so that's hundreds of times HD worth of content. Who's making that? Well, we'll find a company to render it, blah, blah, blah. So, no, you're not. Nobody can render that amount of content for that big a screen, and certainly not at interactively. The only possibility is using GPUs, because we're rendering it in real time. And the content is generated at that resolution in real time. And as long as you can cluster and scale, which we're capable of doing, then you can expand it to whatever resolution you want, as long as your network can handle the traffic. Right? And that's the key, is that all of these giant resolution screens, 4K is already a hassle to produce content for. I'm sure if any of you in the post-production, you know that it's a lot of work to produce content for that. But imagine 8K, imagine 16K, imagine 72K by 1K. Yeah? Those sorts of projects, at that point, it becomes very, very difficult to actually produce content outside of a tool like this. Right? With this, it's a no-brainer. You're designing exactly the same way as you would for any other resolution. And as screens get even, I mean, today, uh, let's see, this ISE, we saw the 1.9 millimeter LED wall. Okay, if you've, I don't know if you've seen an LED wall with 1.9 millimeter pass. It's unbelievably high density. It's amazing. It's stunning. It looks beautiful. But that's a really big pixel density. If you do an LED wall at that size, again, content is an issue. So you need it to be real time. And what we're finding is as the GPU scales, we can do more and more and more, higher resolutions, more content, all of the time. The software scales with it, but you don't require a different content creation process. You don't require different tools. You don't have to go to a tool that all of a sudden can produce 16K content. Yeah, you can do it with the same tools you're already using. All right. Questions? All stunningly happy. Yes? OK. So the question is, uh, what part of the graphics is created in Ventus? What part is brought in? Now, we sit at the end of the DCC pipeline. So you're using Adobe, After Effects, 3D Studio Max, Cinema, Maya, Softimage, whatever you want to create all the content. You're bringing it in here as OBJ files, or as images, or you know, DDS textures, or real time, whatever. You're bringing it in, putting it together inside Ventus. OK. So that's. You're using the same tools as you always would. The only difference is then you're giving it behaviors, interactivity, all of that sort of thing. So for my next thing, I'll just show you how easy it is to make something interactive. Because again, that's one of those things. Making something multi-touch, everybody assumes is a big deal and you need programmers. So let me show you how that does. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to open up the software, the design tool. What we actually have is a design tool and a runtime. They're separated. Um, let me just, no, I don't need to check for online content because there's nothing. There we go. So what I'm just going to do is I'm going to open up. We're a node-based system. And basically everything you work in, if you've ever worked with a 3D tool, it's very, very similar. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get an image in here. I'm going to do your standard pushing an image around the screen kind of a project. You know, the sort of simple stuff that uh, every project needs. Actually, that's one of the problems with multi-touch is I'm still looking for a true multi-touch application that does not involve pushing things around a screen like that. But there we go. Let's get that. And I will just get an image, find something interesting. There, that's an image I was using before. And what I will do is I'm just going to make sure that it's the right aspect ratio, because that's something you need to be able to do. There we go. So we'll just grab that. And so everything is node-based, and you can see but it's fairly straightforward. I'm just connecting nodes and, and bindings. There we go. And I'm just going to scale it up so we can actually see it. Now, right now, this is not multi-touch. So you would like to make a multi-touch application. All we have to do is grab our multi-touch node. There we go. Stick it in front. And now it's multi-touch. So if I now make that full screen and walk carefully over to my thing, then there we go. I've made it multi-touch. Voila. So this is something, and I kid, I mean, it made it, yes, of course, it is a little bit more difficult if you want to do some complex behaviors. But the truth is, any other system to create multi-touch content for any screen size that easily, good luck. Yeah, you do need to know how to program. You do need people that know how to do it. Like this, it really is a designer tool. Yeah. If I need to go into depth and I need to do programming or anything, I can. But we don't require it. 
The other thing is that we're completely agnostic what sort of interface it is. It doesn't matter if it's you know, a Tuyo screen or whatever, Windows Touch, we support them all. So, yes? Yep. Any questions left? None. Oh, yes? Go ahead. Do you actually sell the software to other company to design the Yes, absolutely. It's a software tool. Yep. So it's completely up to whoever wants to do it, buy the software. We'll be glad to help, but we don't need to. <laughs> OK, so thank you very, very much. I hope it. if you have questions, I'll be around. Please feel free to come and ask me, and I'll be glad to show you more examples and things. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, just a reminder, Casino Party is on tonight at uh, 8, 8 p.m.